Hey everyone, it's Tom. Welcome back to the next episode of the Culture Eats Everything podcast. Excited to speak with Rob Dukowitz today, who is the president of Clayton and McCurvey, a CPA and global taxation organization based out of Michigan. And Rob's been there for 32 years. 32 years, if you think about that. So rare these days. And he talks about his journey through the ranks up to becoming president and all the mistakes he made along the way and how his leaders inspired confidence in him and how we can inspire confidence in those that we lead. You know what it takes to build a culture and modeling the way about integrity. We even touch on uh, grandfather clocks and how to communicate when things go wobbly, as Rob likes to call it, that as leaders, it's our responsibility to take care of those wobbly times. So with that, thanks for joining us. Hey, Rob, it's Tom. Thanks for joining us today on our podcast. Thanks so much for being with us. And we were just talking offline before we started here about your mother and uh, her amazing work ethic. So tell us about your mom and what you learned from her as a leader. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks for the invite. Pleasure to be with you. It's always good catching up with you, Tom. Yeah, so my, my mother is... Um, out of all the great influences I've had in my life, and I've had a lot of wonderful influences, my mother's the greatest influence. She has got a work ethic like uh, nobody I've ever seen before. And, uh, you know, probably the best describe my mom, I'll kind of go to a story of uh, someone I was talking to. And this is a, he was a partner at uh, one of our competing firms, very, very good firm. You are always known to attract and retain the best employees. And he always got high, high marks. I remember one time asking him, I said, Bill, I said, what are, what are the things you do? What are the big things that you do? And go ahead and repeatedly get recognized as one of the top employers. And his one comment to me was, is, hey, Rob, it's the small things are the big things. That's what we do. And I think that probably best describes my mom. I mean, it's just the, the small things she does. It's just the friendliness. She's always the one who would reach out if anybody needs any help. Nothing remarkable, but it's just consistently positive, consistently helpful. That's what I've learned more than anything. I can't say I always execute that way, but that is probably what I remember the most. It's the small things, right? And as a leader, I think that's such a, a valuable reminder that oftentimes we get so stuck in the you know, the big stuff, um, not that, not that the strategy, not that the vision, not that all that's not important, but on a day-to-day basis, it is the little things that make the difference as we, as we lead people, as we lead our teams. Um, so how do you, how do you bring that to life in your work nowadays as the, as the president at Clayton McCurvey? Well, you know, like I said, I, 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 w- I wish I was as good as my mom at it, but, uh, you know, I, it's having that connection, I think, with people is probably most important. I mean, in the end, we're people's, we're people, we're human beings. Um, it's, it's driven off of relationships, and to have those relationships, we have to have those connections. You know, I, was, I was fortunate to grow up in the organization I'm in right now at the same time that Don Clayton ended up uh, leading the organization. And Don's leadership style has really influenced me quite a bit. And what I remember most about Don is, is that Don always worked hard to build up my confidence. You know, at any time that you're, you're, you're learning, you're getting uh, new opportunities, there, there's no shortage of mistakes. And I probably made a lot of foolish mistakes, but Don never, ever focused on those. Now, believe me, he wouldn't pass up a teachable opportunity but what I remember most is just how he would build up my confidence. I never forgot that. And that's something that I do try to take with me as I work with my partners or other people in the organization and really find opportunities to go ahead and pat them on the back. I work with some bright, bright people. But like anything else, as, as you go ahead and try to, try to develop into that next level, you're always going to go ahead and get exposed to things that you haven't done before. You're going to make mistakes. But they're remarkable people and just let them know that, hey, you know, you can do this. You do remarkable things. So build up the confidence is something that I, I really try to work on. 
And part of what I heard in that is this encouragement, you know, encouraging them maybe when they do make mistakes that they can do this. What, what else do you do to help build confidence in your team? Well, what, what you'd like to do, like, you know, especially with your, with your good folks is to give them new responsibilities, new opportunities. Um, you know, maybe areas that they themselves didn't think that they had the capabilities to go ahead and do. But you kind of tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, I, I, I think you're right for this. I know you can go ahead and do it. You've got my support. Now, those are the type of things that you, you try to identify, especially for, your, for the type of people in the organization that can take you to the next level. Another thing that Don told me that I've never forgotten, this is absolutely true. Don told me, he says, you know what? In any organization, you need good people. You need a lot of good people. But he says, never underestimate what one great person will be for you in your organization. So anytime that you see those, those type of individuals that really demonstrate that greatness, those are the ones that you really have to try to find opportunity to go ahead and build up their confidence and give them those type of chances, even if they themselves don't believe that they can do it. And, and, and nine times out of 10, they, they do it, and, and quite often they do it um, even beyond what your capabilities are, or beyond what you even thought they could do originally. And beyond what they probably thought was possible for themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll never forget when uh, the board came to me and said, hey, Tom, we think you should be the next CEO. And in my head, I said, what are you, crazy? <laughs> out loud, I said, yeah, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but and, and you did a wonderful job, Tom. So obviously they, they saw something in you that, uh, you know, maybe you didn't even see in yourself. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It, um, uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience at 34 years old, getting to take on that responsibility. Um, and, you know, you know, as one of my board members, one of my many bosses, um, you know, it was a challenging time and an exciting time. We were growing and, and opening a, a brand new high school that you were yeah. part of, um, one of the top 25 innovative schools in the country at the time. Um, so very, very exciting, but below the surface, I can tell you that the, the confidence wasn't there, you know, that I, I very much struggled with imposter syndrome. Um, and I'm just curious for yourself if, if you see any of that in your own leadership journey. Um, yeah, to a certain extent, I will tell you, you know, maybe the one thing that comes with the old age is, is uh, you seem to care less about what other people think. I do think that is one of the things that, that uh, when you're younger, you're probably a little bit more preoccupied. Not, not, not that what others think isn't important, but, you know, more of the, dra the, more of the drama aspect of the job. I, I think as you get older, <coughs> less and less of a, of a concern. Uh, what, what people think in some of those aspects, but a lot of it also just comes with the, uh, with experience. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's not that we don't care what people think. just put less uh, importance on it and you're able to focus on the job at hand. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I, I remember somebody told me, I remember, I mean, this, this was a long time ago when I turned 40, someone said, Hey, the best thing about being 40 is, is that you just realize that you're comfortable in your own skin and you really don't care what other people think. <laughs> and that, you know, that, that maybe is a little bit dramatic, but there's probably a, a fair amount of truth to that. It just comes with maturity. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've been president for four years now and you've spent, I think, 32 years with yeah. Peter Curvy, which is really, frankly, uh, almost unheard of these days. So. Talk to us a little bit about that loyalty, maybe, and, and what that means to you. Well, yeah, you know, I, I can't say I had this grand plan when I came out of college. And, you know, matter of fact, I'll, I'll tell this to, to recruits when people come in to the organization. You know, people are, you know, I think they feel compelled, like they have to know all the answers when they're 22 or 23 years old, they start an, organ, an organization, know exactly how things going to play out. And I tell them, I said, you know, honestly, when I was, 22 or 23 looking for a job, let me be honest, I, I knew very little about what I was getting into. And I didn't have any grand plans. And frankly, my, my biggest plan is I want to have enough money so I can move out of the house. That's what I wanted. And, and uh, 
I, I just happen to be fortunate. I happen to pick a good profession. I happen to pick a good firm. And like I said, I, I joined the organization at the same time that, that Don was leading the organization. But I kind of fell in love with it. And I will tell you this, I, I happen to, to be in an industry, and I think you know something about this, Tom. I'm in an industry, uh, public accounting is a great place to be. And um, quite often it's, it's, it's a good feeder for other areas for people to grow. So a lot of people who start in public accounting don't necessarily stay in public accounting. And for, and for good reasons, for good reasons, as a matter of fact, I, I saw that a lot. I, you know, I joined the firm and I would see people stick around for a few years, good people, and then they would move on or, or people that I knew that I went to college with, you know, I would see them stick with their original employer for three or four years or five years and then move on. And I, and I always kind of thought, I said to myself, geez, they, they must be seeing something I don't, you know, I, I, I must be blind to something. What's going on here? Why, why are they moving on and I'm not? And I really, so I, I started to think about it and I thought to myself, well, if I were to leave, where would I go and what would I expect to go into? And in the end, I, I just kind of came up with the decision. I said, you know what, for me, I always wanted to be in a position to control my own destiny. And I always wanted to be in a position to drive revenue. I just felt like that gave me the greatest opportunity to live the life I wanted. If I was driving the revenue side, I felt like my, my potential for growth, and potential to live the type of life I wanted to, was the greatest. So I, I came down to, to those two factors. Then I sat back and I looked at it and I said, well, hey, I, I think I can do that here. I, I feel like I have those opportunities here. And that's why I ended up staying where I did. I mean, that was the right thing for me. And it, it happened to work out. So. And now you've got a, a wonderful and, and growing team that uh, works around the world, right? I and mean, that's part of your yeah. global taxation business. So you're serving clients all over the world. And as you've grown, what have you learned about what it takes to to lead a, a, a team like that, that, that is all over the world. And especially in a time like this, where we're dealing with the pandemic. And so yeah. a lot of our work is virtual. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I will tell you this, when, when the world kind of got turned upside down in March, it, um, you know, I guess if you stick around long enough, you'll see just about everything. This would have been nothing I would have never predicted. I don't know if anybody could have predicted, but, you know, saying that it, 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 it was as close as to seamless as I think we could have gone to, to kind of go from this in the office environment to really this distributed workforce environment. Um, and, and I would say this, you know, in the end, what, what makes it work the best is really dependent upon your culture. You know, as I, I, tell, I, I, I tell people this, you know, if you, if you look at it, whenever you go through a crisis, now I'm going to talk like an accountant, so I hope your listeners can bear with me here. But anytime you go through a crisis, it's important to have a strong balance sheet, right? In other words, you, you, don't, you don't know where the bottom is. And that's why you need to always have a, ha a healthy balance sheet. You've got to have plenty, you know, you've got to have cash, you've got to have good working capital, you've got to have a manageable debt load, you've got to have, uh, uh, you've got to have equity on your balance sheet because it's like, it's like, a, it's like a hard winter. It's like, oh my gosh, the winter is going to be tough. We don't know how tough it's going to be. We don't know how long it's going to last, but it's a good thing we have a lot of nuts squirreled, you know, a lot, a lot of nuts squirreled up because we're going to need them. Um, and, and that is true. But what I would also tell you this, probably the best thing that any company has on their balance sheet is their culture. What, what is their culture? What is their organization? That's... I would say is the most important aspect because your, your team members are, are going to have to go ahead and be in work environments that they haven't been before. They got to communicate differently than what they're accustomed to communicating. They have to go through crises. They have clients that are going through issues. They're, they themselves are being confronted with issues. Maybe they have to teach their children now at, at home, pick up that slack, playing that role. They, they would have, uh, you know, perhaps both spouses working from home. So there's just a whole host of reasons why there can be a lot of anxiety that is out there, a lot of frustration and a lot of factors for burnout. 
and, and there's no, unfortunately, nobody can wave a magic wand to make that stuff disappear. And, and that's just what happens. But having that strong balance sheet, that strong culture, just puts you in a much better position to get through it. So people are honest, people are vulnerable with where they're at. So you, so they can share that with you and so you can help them out. That's, that's extremely important to get through this, this pandemic. And um, I, I would say, I, I think as an organization, we're pretty, pretty darn good there. Pretty darn good there. I mean, I mean we've had our bumps and at, at certain times people go through it at different levels, but I do think having that strong culture has really put us in a good position to get through this. Yeah, it's evident from just even listening to your people talk about the, what they love about the job is the people, you know, is the, the folks that they get to work with, the clients that you get to serve. There's a, you can, you can almost taste the, the focus on culture. Um, and as you know, we, we believe culture eats everything. Um, and it's Absolutely. The, the I, love, I love that saying, by the way. I love that saying. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we think it's the number one, you know, competitive advantage that, that you have, period. But building it is, <clears throat> is a whole nother thing. So how have you gone about that? What advice would you give to another CEO or president who's looking to build a strong culture? Well, I mean, culture is people. And it's making sure that, first of all, you get the right people <laughs> in the organization. I don't think you can ever be too cautious or have <clears throat> Have, have high enough standards on who determines comes in the organization and who stays. I think that's an important, an important part. I think defining your culture is also important. You know, there's not a, I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong culture, but every organization has a culture and making sure that, that the people who come in your culture understand it and so they can adapt to it. And I, th and I think really the most important part is to model the way, especially the leaders. The leaders have to model the way. You can't, you can't tell the culture is this and then go ahead and behave another way. I mean, it's, it's like being with kids, right? Like telling your kids, hey, don't, you know, don't swear, you know, don't, don't have a potty mouth, don't talk to people this way. But if they see mom or dad doing it, uh, you're not going to fool anybody. So I, I think... Having a high standard, especially for your leaders, is probably the most essential in, in not only communicating the culture, but maintaining it. In your business, I would imagine that, you know, integrity is seminal to your relationships. Um, talk a little bit about the role of integrity and what you all do. Well, yeah. I mean, so... Um, I mean, obviously, it's very important. I mean, just our role from a very literal perspective. Um, you know, being honest, being forthright, being ethical is, is really kind of the center of what we do. I mean, we're fortunate. We happen to be in a profession where quite often the CPA is the most trusted advisor that a client will have. And we work hard to maintain that. We, we do work hard to maintain it. And so to have that is, is, is extremely important from that perspective. But from a broader perspective, you know, and working with, with uh, your colleagues, especially with partners, you know, in an organization like ourselves, um, you know, the, a very common way for individuals to move up through the organization is ultimately ownership, or as quite often here are partners. So these people literally will have their greatest financial um, investment in the organization. And so you have other partners that you're accountable to. And some of the decisions you make is gonna affect their greatest, greatest element of, of what they built up, at least financially. So you have to take it extremely seriously. So in, integrity expands just beyond preparing stuff honestly and, and ethically, but it's also being ethical to each other, you know, following through on the promises, doing what you say you're gonna do, and not putting your partners at risk. Um, and just, and that all comes from having good relationships, which takes time, right? And that's the investment that you have to make. Yeah, and I think that, that doing what you say you're gonna do is the sort of key point in all of this, is that if you think about the word integrity, it really means to integrate, you know, to integrate your word and your action, to, to do what you say you're gonna do. And, Frankly, nowadays, uh, that's not terribly 
present in many organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and it gets back to your, you know, where we started this conversation with your mother talking about the little things. It's the little things that we do as leaders that build that culture of integrity. That if we don't do what we say we're gonna do as a leader, then how can we expect our, our team to do the same thing? Absolutely, totally agree. So uh, as we kind of wrap up our time here, we'd love to um, just get your recommendation on a, a book. You know, if there was one book you could uh, recommend for young leaders out there or, or fellow leaders um, that really made a difference in your life, what would that be? Well, you know, my confession is I'm not a big reader and I, I wish I was. But, um, you know, the books that I've, I've liked are by uh, Pat Lencioni. You know, Pat, Pat writes a lot of books and for people like myself, I, you know, I apologize. One of the things of working in my mother's house is you have to listen to this uh, grandfather clock. So. Oh, I love it. I love it. That's a, that's a very natural part of this podcast is we're not pretending to, to over uh, produce this. We just want to have. Yeah. Well, that, that, that'll, that'll add a, a, an element of, of reality to the whole process. Right, a unique twist. I love it. <laughs> But I, I, you know, I've always liked his books. I mean, in in um, they're, they're they're written in a very easy, of uh, easy format. They're kind of written in a fable type format. Uh, the one that I, I really like that I, I refer to often. The nice thing that I can read in about an hour, hour and a half, is uh, the Four Obsessions of an Extraordinary Executive, and it just talks about you know what what. You know, what, what, what they talk about in that book, it's just really a need to go ahead and communicate and over communicate and reinforce with your people your, the communication. And I will tell you this, what I find in my role is when things start going wobbly <laughs> or when I get this sense like, ah, you know, things just aren't going right. I mean, I, I, the connection isn't the same. It almost universally comes down to communication almost all the time. And so that's, that, that's a book I will refer to often. Um, pretty straightforward, pretty simple, but, you know, Tom, Tom you and I are both uh, religious people, but it's like the Bible. The Bible is easy to understand. It's pretty simple, but let's be honest, to execute it isn't always so, so simple. So it's kind of the same, comes from that same genre. Easy to understand. Sometimes you just don't always execute on it, but it's always nice to know that you have that that to lean back on and to reinforce. Yes, yes, it's uh, the faith hasn't been tried and found lacking. It's been tried and found hard to do. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh, I love that, I love that quote, that's a good one. It, it's, it's a reminder every day, you know, for me anyway, um, with doing, doing my work with helping folks across the country, with raising my own three kids with my amazing wife, you know, it's, it shows up almost hourly for me <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, it does. Life. Oh, good so the communication i can't let that one go rob because you know when we do our work um it is the number one challenge that ceos will bring to us you know um they'll say that communication is the problem um and the problem with that word is it means everything and it means nothing and so it's hard to to dissect because if you think about it, you know, we get plenty of emails. There's certainly enough tweets and Facebook posts and LinkedIn posts and um, Instagram pictures and uh, newsletters. And it's not, it's not from a lack of, of information. It's, it's almost a uh, too much, right? It's overwhelming. Yeah. So right. what is it about communication that, that you see as a leader is so important? I just think, you know, I, I don't, how do I say this? Um, I, I think you're absolutely right, Tom. I mean, um, communication is just not words or, or, or sending out emails and stuff like that, even though I th that's an essential part of it. Um, you know, the communication obviously is the, the element of the relationship. And you can't have a relationship without communication, but that doesn't necessarily mean because you're communicating that you do have a relationship. So it's, it's, it's always finding, I, I think it's always finding that balance. I do think what, what does happen quite often in, in situations where people develop into leaders, 
No, at some point in time, you know, somebody taps you on the shoulder like they did to you and said, hey, we want you to go into this role. But like in our profession, you know, our, I mean, to be successful in our profession, you got to learn to be an accountant. And you have to go through that stage. And how people advance in their careers is they start by being good accountants. But when they advance into the, to, to whatever role that is, whether it's managing people, managing departments, managing an organization, it's, it's a different set of skills that, that they, have to, they have to learn. And what people quite often forget, the most important skill set is the communication. And there's no, there's no magic pill. Matter of fact, I, I just, when I, I, what I've been working on over the last year and a half is really kind of a reorganization, putting people into different leadership roles into the organization. And what I told them is, is your, your, your most important job is that now you are the leader of staff communication. You are the communication director of your department. You have to remember that. And, and it may sound trite, it may sound simple, it, it may even sound like, really? What, what do you tell me for? What do you tell me this for? What you find out is, is that you will have to continue to go back to that time after time after time. Because again, if, if, you're having, if you're having issues, issues can come from a variety of different reasons, but almost universally, it comes down to some lapse in communication somehow, somewhere. And that's the one thing that I think people have to, have to continue to rem uh, remember. Believe me, I'm, I'm, t I'm telling you this not from, from a position that I've excelled at. It's quite, quite the opposite. I've, I've learned it from the, from the school of hard knocks. You know, it's, like I said, a lot of times when things start going wobbly, and they go wobbly often, it's like, oh my gosh, I, I forgot my number one role is I'm the communication director. I'm falling down again. I'm not doing it uh, correctly. When I say communication director, it doesn't mean now all of a sudden next thing you do is you get on the podium and start spewing out um, what, what a CEO does. It's, 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 typically, it's a little bit more nuanced than that, but it's important. Yeah, and that fundamentally, it boils down to relationships, that as long as we have established and spent the time to build relationships with our our people and our team, then we can have the conversations that we need to have. You know, there's some irony in this because you and I have a, a good relationship. And when we first started doing this recording, the communication wasn't very good. The technology wasn't <laughs> working with us, right? And even now, yeah. there's a few parts where you're breaking up a little bit. And so one could argue the communication isn't good here. But the real value that, that I see in this example is that you and I have already built such a relationship that we can talk about that. You know, we can say, hey, Rob, let's try something else because this isn't working. And it's not, it's no offense to you. It's no offense to me. It's just, let's try something different. Try something different. Yeah. Totally agree, Tom. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks again for the time, my friend. I appreciate it. And um, we've learned a little bit about what it takes to, to do the small things from your mom all the way through to... <laughs> the grandfather clocks and what to do when things get wobbly. So we appreciate your, your insights and thoughts on leadership and appreciate the time. Yeah, you're very welcome, Tom. And thanks again for reaching out. And I, I wish you, Brad, and your organization continued success. I think you guys are, are doing great stuff out there. So best of luck. All right. Thanks, Rob. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.